We began a series last Sunday called Foundations, and we looked at what it means to be people of the book, that God chose the nation of Israel, and they were distinct in many ways, but one of the things that made them so distinct was that they were people of the book, that God had spoken, and they had his words before them, and they were called to live a life based upon the teachings of the book. And so as we move from there, we begin to realize that one of the foundations of our life this morning is to understand what does it mean to believe in God. George Gallup, as we know, is famous for making all kinds of uh, polls, and he talks to people in different realms of life and in different circumstances and situations of life. So he asked the people this question, did they believe in God? So he just had ordinary folks like you and me, wherever he would encounter them in uh, this uh, research that he was doing. And when he did this poll, he found out that 96% said, yes, I believe in God. But of that group of people, only 63% said this, God is important in my life. So people can believe in God, but is he really important? in a person's life. It's interesting that over the century, centuries of time, the people of God have affirmed all over the world their belief in God. In fact, if we think about the opening words of the creeds or the confessions of the church, the apostolic creed begins with these words, I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. And at the end of the service this morning, we're going to actually sing what we believe. And so I'm going to ask you to think about it. Do I really believe those words that I am actually singing? Do I actually believe in God? Because the Bible tells us that the devil believes in God and he trembles. So there's a concept of belief that we want to take hold of. So it's one thing to say, I believe in God. But it is something else to say, I know why I believe in God. And as we begin to understand why we believe in God, it makes an incredible difference in our world. Some time ago, there was a comic. His name was Carl Valentin. And what he would do is he would come to the stage where he was doing his performance. And when he stood there, I was thinking of trying to do this this morning, but I realized the lights wouldn't work. He would just have the room darkened for a few moments and there would be a single ray of light shining upon him. And in this sphere where the light was, he was wandering around and wandering around, looking and looking. And someone came to him and said, what is your problem? Why are you wandering around? And he said, I've lost my keys and I'm looking for them. And they said to him, are you sure you lost your keys here? He said, oh, no, I lost them over there. Well, why are you looking here? Because that's where the light is, he said. Well, it doesn't make much sense. And yet a lot of people are searching for God with the light that they have. And the problem is many people are looking in all the wrong places to discover God. And so this morning we're going to be looking at God's existence. Does God really exist? Can I say that I actually believe in God? And God has given us incredible opportunities to begin to explore his existence. But I want to begin by making a statement. We cannot categorically prove the existence of God. If you try to do that philosophically, you're going to end up twisted and turning in the wind. But I love the words of Tim Keller from Redeemer Church uh, in New York City. Tim Keller has written numerous books. Many people believe that he is the modern-day C.S. Lewis. He's also a Presbyterian, so that kind of (laughs) helps. But Keller said this, Though we can't prove the existence of God, we look for the clues of God. And this morning, I want to share with you four clues that point us to God 
And you're going to have to make a decision. Do you believe in God? Do you believe in God? And does that belief make any difference in your day-to-day -day living? Well, the first thing I would like us to look at is the reality of creation. In fact, we could spend hours here this morning just talking about creation. But when we look at Romans 1 in the reading we had this morning, part of it said, For since the creation of the world, God's invisible attributes, and here are two, His eternal power and divine nature have been seen. So God says, I want you to look at creation. And even in nature, I have given you some clues about my existence. And there are two things that stand out. You can see the power of God, which has existed from the beginning, and even beyond that, through all of eternity. And you see His divine nature. You see the handprint of God all over creation. So we look, for example, at Psalm 19 that we read at the very beginning this morning, which declares, The heavens declare the glory of God, and their expanse is declaring the work of His hands. So I would invite you just for a moment to take a look at creation. It is marvelous when we take time to think about it. It would fill us with a sense of awe and wonder. Think about all the order in creation. Think about the design and the beauty. Now, when, before I entered into the sanctuary, I took a look at the window and I saw it's starting to snow a bit. And they tell us no two snowflakes are alike. Would you like to go out and count how many are out there today? And just think of that kind of design and beauty that God has built into creation. And the question is, how did all this happen in creation? So I think we are left with one of two choices. First of all, did the universe just begin by chance, or is there purpose and design behind the universe? Now some will go for the first option, that the universe began by infinite time plus chance to explain the origin of the universe. Some people will say the earth was like a primordial soup and there was some jolt by incredible and frequent electrical charges that were given off. And that happened over an unlimited period of time. And out of that, some life began to evolve. But let me tell you this, there are many Christian scientists who would not hold that teaching one of them is Sir Frederick Hoyle. He is one of the most distinguished astronomers in the world. And he said, if you believe that, then you can believe this. He said, imagine that you are going into a junkyard. And in the junkyard, there is every imaginable piece of a 747. Have any of you ever been on a 747? Some of you have. You know, that's a pretty big plane, right? So imagine all the pieces that go into making a 747. And Sir Frederick Hoyle says, this is lying in piles all over this junkyard. And then he says, there's an incredible tornado that blows through this junkyard. And all of the parts of the 747 are assembled. And this plane is ready for takeoff after the tornado has passed through the junkyard. He said there's a greater possibility of that happening than of the world coming into being with all of its uniqueness and diversity based upon infinite time and chance where there have been electrical impulses that have enabled this to come together. The other option is life does not happen by chance, but rather there is order and there is design. So let me just give you two little instances. And there are a multitude more that could be given, but two that are pretty straightforward. The earth is the exact correct distance from the sun. If there was even a small infinitesimal change in that distance, it would be too hot for us to live here. 
or too cold for us to live here. If you look at the tilt of the Earth's axis, that ensures the changing of the seasons. We are told that on the Earth there are over 11 million different species of life, and each one is a living miracle. So go outside and look around. What does the psalmist say? The heavens declare the glory of God. And their expanse is declaring the work of his hands. Behind it all, we see the hand of a creator who has given order and design and beauty, and it leaves us with awe. The second clue that we might talk about is a little different. We live with principles of right and wrong. C.S. Lewis, who uh, for many years was an atheist, if not an agnostic, he struggled with the whole Christian faith. And when he came to Christ, his life was dramatically changed. And he became one of the strongest speakers about the Christian faith that the past century has ever known. And he said, think about this. The way people argue gives a clue to the existence of God. Now, I'm sure you're all nice folks and you've never argued in your life. But if perchance you've ever argued, it's a clue to everybody else that God actually exists. How does that happen? Well, just think about what people say and try to figure out this. I do way more than my fair share of the work. And you seem to do so little around this house. They're called husbands and wives. <laughs> Someone else will say, he got a bigger piece than I did. How come her allowance is more than mine? How come he can stay out later at night than I can? They're called brothers and sisters. When we say things like, that's not right. That's not good. You're not being fair with me in what's taking place. What we are doing even in those statements is that we are appealing to a standard that is independent, that is objective, and it's higher than you or I. So what does Paul say? Look at these words. Now, sometimes when I read this, I find it a little confusing, so I'm going to try to explain it in simple language that I can understand. But he says this, When Gentiles, that is non-Jews, who do not have the law, which is the word of God, do instinctively, notice that word, instinctively, the things of the law, these not having the law, they become a law unto themselves in that they show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience bearing witness, and their thoughts alternately accusing or else defending them. So he says, when people don't have the law, such as the word of God, they have another law. They have a sense of right and wrong. Have you ever met anybody who doesn't have a sense of right and wrong? If you have, they're called a sociopath. We are caught up with, with situations where we say, do I do this? Do I not do this? And if I do it and I believe it's wrong, but I'm going to do it anyway, my conscience starts to bother me. Every person knows two things. There is a right way that I ought to behave. There is a code or a standard that I need to follow. And the second thing is that I know I don't always live up to the standard that I believe in. And sometimes the standard can be that which is the Word of God. For some people who don't have the Word of God, that standard can just be their conscience in their own heart. But all of us know that there have been times when we have not lived up to the standard of life that God has called us to. And when that happens, we know we have failed. 
And when we have failed, we know we need to be made right. And so we go before God as the people of God. And we go before others that we have wronged. So think about this. Every time people argue, they are implying that there's evidence that we are not an accident in this world, that there is a moral order to our universe. There is right and there is wrong. And it was put there by someone. And that someone is God himself, whether I acknowledge him or not. The third clue is what I would call the uniqueness of people. If I look around here this morning, we're all a little bit different. I mean that in a positive way. (laughs) I mean, there are some different people, and we all know who they are. Um, But we're all quite unique. We're all different individuals. And some people approach life, they can be very pessimistic, such as, you know... Don't get your hopes up. They're the people with the glass half empty. And there are other people who are very upbeat and they're optimistic. And they believe that humankind is the measure of all things. It's interesting that in Christianity, it has both perspectives about people. Whoops. I'm trying to figure out how to get this thing back. There we go. Whoop, now I've really done it. <laughs> if you can sort me out, that would be good. The first thing is from the prophet Jeremiah. And Jeremiah says this, The heart is more deceitful than all else and is desperately wicked. Who can know it? Have you ever thought of that? Have you ever thought about that in terms of your own life? that your heart is more deceitful than all else and it is desperately wicked? How do I know myself? But on the other hand, we find these words that John wrote. Now we are the children of God. We know that when he appears, we shall be like him because we shall see him as he is. The Bible says... We are unique as people. We have those things where our heart is desperately wicked and those realities that we live with the hope that one day we shall not only see God, but we shall be like Him. The Bible says that we are made in the image of God. We are more than just atoms that have, <clears throat> excuse me, that have been put together. We are people who possess a soul. We know that we are different from the rest of creation that we are different from the animal world, and we are not simply the products of instinct and training. Think about it. We have the ability to reason. We have the ability to make choices, so we have freedom. We are moral agents enabling ourselves to make choices between what we know is right and what we know is wrong. But perhaps the most significant thing of all is this. We know and we believe that there is something more than just here and now. The reality is these words from Ecclesiastes. God has made everything appropriate in his time. But notice this. And he has set eternity in our hearts. If you believe that all you have is life here on earth, that's very limited. And as I talk with people, they say, isn't there more? I've been at the deathbed of so many people that I've lost count. But I do know this, that at the end of their days, they want to know, is there more? And some people going through this journey say, even in a very young age, is this all that there is? God has placed eternity in our hearts. And many people go through really tough and difficult times. They know what it is to have heartache. They know what it is to have sorrow. They know what it is to have sickness, to have broken lives and distorted minds. And some people say, my life is so empty. And there are some people who think, I've got it all, 
But when they've got it all, they've discovered that their life is meaningless. And that was the words of Solomon, who was the richest man of his day. And as he looked at everything he had and everything he had accomplished, he said, this can be like the chasing after the wind. It will never satisfy you. It will never give you the, the things you really want in your life. Because life becomes simply an endless cycle. And let me tell you this, that life without God ultimately is meaningless because God made it that way. We're hardwired that way by God. And unless God is there, nothing will ultimately satisfy the deepest needs of a person's heart. So can you imagine living with the concept that there is no God? Now this is true in many nations today. You are not permitted to believe in God or to talk about God. <clears throat> Years ago, before the collapse of the Soviet Union, the churches were empty, but many believers had gone underground. You had to believe in the communist ideal, and we saw how that went. During that time, a couple of Olympics ago, you probably remember this, there was a young Soviet athlete, and he was a diver. You know those high towers they dive off into? And he was doing a three and a half somersault, and he was tucked in, but he came too close to the board, and he cracked his head on the way down. He was 30 feet in the air when that happened. And they took him to the hospital where he was in a coma. Can you imagine being his parents, being in that room while your child is dying, and you are absolutely helpless to do anything to help your child, and you have been taught there is no God there is no ultimate purpose. This is all that there is. Yet in our hearts, we are longing for more. And the reason we long for more is because God has put eternity in our hearts. You see, we were made for a purpose. And the purpose is that we know God and that we love God and that we find our fulfillment in Him and that is for all of eternity. It's not just for a few short years on this planet Earth. God has made everything appropriate in his time. And he has set eternity in our hearts. And the final clue for this morning is this. There are changed lives. And as I look at changed lives, that points so directly to the work of God in people's lives. You see, that's the business of God. God is in the business of changing people's lives. And we, we find that evidence in men and women and young people from the past and in the present, even in this moment here. People gather here this morning. You are the evidence of God because of the way in which he has changed and is changing your life. It happens to people who are tax collectors. It happens to people who are despised. It happens to the wealthy. It happens to the poor. It happens to the educated and the uneducated. It happens to people who are considered hopeless causes. There's something about Jesus that attracted people to him and their lives were radically transformed. Perhaps the most obvious one is Saul of Tarsus. He was proud. He was vindictive. He was arrogant. He was a religious leader. But when he encountered Jesus, his life was transformed. And so he wrote these powerful words. If anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation. All things passed away. Behold, new things have come. Think about how your life has been transformed by this encounter with God. What are the old things that are passing away? What are the things that are becoming new and transformational in your life? We've often sung that hymn, Amazing Grace. And you know the story of John Newton, who was a slave trader. And he considered himself a vile man. And yet, when God got a hold of his life, it was transformed and he became 
an advocate for the abolition of slavery along with Wilberforce. And here was a man who would write these words, Amazing grace, how sweet the sound, that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I am found. I was blind, but now I see. Do you hear the transformation? Do you see the change in his life? Some of you might be familiar with a man called Ernest Gordon. He was a prisoner of war in a Japanese prison camp. He later became the chaplain at Princeton University. And while he was in that prison camp, the men were like animals, stealing food from one another, taking, just being focused on themselves. And so in desperation, they found a Bible and they started to read the New Testament. And Gordon himself was a skeptic. And he was asked to lead the group in reading the Bible and in studying the Bible. So here's a skeptic leading a group of skeptics who become like animals in the way they treat one another, just clawing and scratching out an existence, trying to make it through another day. And this group of scrounging, clawing humanity became transformed into a community of love by the power of God. I was reading a couple excerpts from this book. You might be familiar, we have copies of it in the library, called A Case for Faith. He's written A Case for Christ and A Case for Creation. It's by Lee Strobel. Lee Strobel makes no pretense. He was an atheist for years. A lawyer by trade and a journalist, he wrote for the Chicago Papers, and his wife was a believer. And he kept looking at her life, and he couldn't deny the reality of Christ in her life and the change that God was making in her life. And after years and years of struggle and fighting against it, he surrendered to the Lordship of Christ, and he became a changed man. Here he is, an advocate of God. His life was changed. This shows the reality of God in Jesus Christ. And people are still experiencing that life-transforming power of God. But who can bring about those kind of radical changes? The most wonderful truth we need to hear this morning is this, is that God desires to be intimately involved in each of our lives. God does not just want to be an idea or a concept such as, well, I believe in God. I said at the very beginning, the devil believes in God. It doesn't bring a transformation. But to believe in God is, I, got, I want God to be intimately involved in my life. I want to surrender to him as the sovereign Lord of heaven and earth. So to say I believe in God takes far more than just an assent to a belief system. But it's a statement whereby I commit my life to him. And in doing so, I find him to be the foundation of my life. We might not have all the answers, but we want to begin. We begin by saying, God, I want to believe in you. I want to commit my life to you, to know your transforming work day by day. Let's pray together.